Hey, good morning, Revelstoke Alliance Church. This is the sermons. I'm preaching them again early in the week that I preached on Sunday. Uh, we're currently working our way through the Bible, looking at the question, are some ministry roles restricted to men only? Or can either gender participate in every ministry role in the church? I think, biblically, there are no gender restrictions to ministry roles within the church, including elder or senior pastor. So far, we have looked at the relationship between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, both before and after they sinned. We looked at the Hebrew phrase, Ezer Kenegdo, Ezer Kenegdo, a giver of strength, of equal value, a true partner that God used to describe both himself and Eve. And then briefly, we looked at some of the different women that God used in different leadership capacities in Israel in the Old Testament. Then last week, we looked through the Gospels and saw that despite the culture at the time in Israel marginalizing educational, religious, social, and legal opportunities for women, that Jesus included women in his discipleship group and empowered them to be preachers of the Gospel. This week, we're going to have two sermons, double sermon. Well, I was going to say Sunday. I preached these on Sunday, so double sermon, middle of the week, whenever you watch this. Uh, The first one, we're going to look at how women were involved in the early church. We're going to look at the book of Acts and Romans and 1 Corinthians. And then we're going to take a break and we're going to examine the verse from 1 Timothy that seems to prohibit women from preaching or leading in the church and see if we can reconcile it with the rest of the scriptures that we've read. So let's dive into the book of Acts and read about women in the early church. Now, it is definitely, most certainly true that initially the 12 main disciples of Jesus, all men, were the leading figures in the church. That point cannot be overlooked. But let's read how the church was started, day one of the church, on the day of Pentecost. Jesus had just ascended into heaven, and all of his followers gathered together in Jerusalem to wait for the fulfilling of the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then Acts 1, verse 12 to 16, reads as follows. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. It was a Sabbath day's walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said. So then he was on to say that they need to elect a replacement for Judas Iscariot, who had hung himself after betraying Jesus. They elect a man by the name of Matthias, and then this happens in chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of those 120 followers of Jesus, the 11 main disciples plus Matthias and everyone else, including a group of women and Mary, Jesus' mother, they all received this miraculous baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, at that time, there is a large multitude of people in Jerusalem there to worship at the temple for the Feast of Tabernacles, Jewish believers from all around the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Many of them hear this speaking in tongues, this outpouring of praise in other languages, and they want to know what is happening. Some of the hearers think it might be a miracle. Others think that Jesus' followers are drunk, uh, not sure what's happening. But Peter stands up and he replies, verse 14, Uh, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain to you, listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So the Holy Spirit is poured out on this brand new church. A new covenant is opened up for both Jew and Gentile, for slave and free, for men and women. All are welcome. 
and the Holy Spirit will give miraculous gifts to empower the church and to walk in this New Covenant or New Testament. We read here that the Holy Spirit will be giving gifts like speaking in tongues and prophecy. And God makes a point of saying that both men and women, both old and young, will receive these gifts and thus they'll be expected to use these gifts to build up the church. Now, why would the Holy Spirit give the gift of prophecy to both men and women if both genders were not to use them? What is the gift of prophecy exactly? Well, there is some disagreement on that. Some Bible teachers think that the gift of prophecy is an unprepared message directly from God that comes to a person miraculously from heaven, and that person is like a channel for what God wants to say. And then other Bible teachers think that prophecy is uh, like a prepared talk, uh, also inspired by God, but based on scripture, teaching, and an exhortation by the Spirit through the person for the church to walk in God's ways as outlined in the Bible, what we would call a sermon. Now, whether it was prepared or unprepared, uh, both men and women were expected to use this gift. They were gifted with this in the early church. Uh, we can see an example of that in Acts 21, verse 7 to 9. Uh, we, that's Luke and Paul, we continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemus where we were greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a few days. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, what was the culture of the day and the areas where Paul was preaching and most of the book of Acts takes place? Well, you had two main cultures at play. So, I mean, you had the culture in Israel. We looked at that last week where Jesus was ministering in. And then Paul was mostly ministering to the Gentile nations. And they had two main cultures that were interacting in that day, the Greek and the Roman culture. We're going to look first at the Greek culture and then we'll look at the Roman culture. So in the Greek culture which was found throughout Asia Minor and Greece. It was spread by Alexander the Great a couple of hundred of years before the events in the Book of Acts. In the Greek culture, women were unable to vote, even though they had democracies. Women were not given the vote. They were unable to own land. They were unable to inherit wealth. In fact, baby girls were abandoned, often abandoned at birth, uh, as they were seen as another mouth to feed and with little inherent worth. Uh, one of the early Christian ministries, believers would take these babies abandoned at the side of the road or at the garbage dump, and they'd take them home and raise them in their own family. They would save the lives of these babies, predominantly girls. Uh, women in Greek culture were expected to be faithful to their husbands and produce baby boys so that the baby boys could inherit the family wealth. Uh, but husbands were not expected at all to be faithful to their wives. They were expected to take lovers of either gender. Wives were for carrying on the family lineage. Lovers were for enjoyment and entertainment. Uh, Greek women, however, were very active in religion, and we'll talk more about that in the next uh, sermon. So given this culturally very restrictive Greek context, let's go back to the book of Acts and read about one married couple in particular. And this is in Acts 8. We're going to read verses 1 to 3 and then 18 to 26. Verse 1 to 3. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, both in Greece. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, who, uh, um, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Paul stayed on in Corinth, verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sisters, and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut because of a vow that he'd taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, uh, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and he taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. 
He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So that was the uh, book of Acts. Then in 1 Corinthians verse uh, chapter 16, verse 19, we read, The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. So here we have Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple, both tent makers, converted in Corinth, sailed with Paul as part of his missionary team to Ephesus, where Paul left them to teach the church. They run into a young preacher called Apollos, who knows something of the gospel, but not everything. But both Priscilla and Aquila explained to him the way of God more adequately. Literally in Greek, they corrected his theology, then sent him off as a preacher of the gospel. Then some time later, they returned to Corinth, and they both lead the church there together with the congregation meeting in their home. And we'll see in a minute that they later ended up working in the Church of Rome as well. Now we've read of other women, and we read of other women in the book of Acts. Uh, Mary, the mother of John Mark, who used her house as a place for prayer and meeting for the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, Tabitha, a follower of Jesus in Joppa, who was so beloved for her ministry to the poor and the widows that the church pleaded with Peter to pray for her, and she was raised from the dead. Then we have Lydia, who is a businesswoman who sold purple cloth, a pagan worshiper who was converted when Paul preached in Philippi, and she opened up her home as a missions base for Paul as he preached throughout Greece. So women held churches in their homes, women financed and supported Paul's missions, and the women taught and trained other preachers in theology and preaching. Now, when we read in 1 Corinthians, we read that the church there in Corinth and Greece, there was some strife between men and women, which was crystallized around the subject of whether women should or could wear head coverings when praying in the service. Now, I don't want to go into the intricacies of that passage today, the details of it. It is a challenging passage. If you've got questions about it, feel free to give me a call at church and we can chat about that chapter. But one thing I do want to point out in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, it says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as having her head shaved. So the point I want to make today is this. Women were both praying and prophesying publicly in church. They were being used by God to both pray and prophesy. And again, prophesying, that could mean preaching. Now, if we switch from the Greek culture that, you know, the church in Corinth were in and look at the Roman culture, and then we'll look at the church in Rome. So Roman culture was all centered around the home and the head of the home was called the pater familias. Now, he was not just the head of his immediate family, but he was the head of his extended family and slaves and property. He was in charge and he had to provide. The paterfamilias had to be loyal to two institutions, the Roman state and his extended family. He had the responsibility to make sure everyone in his household was a good Roman citizen and he had the legal authority to punish anyone in his household who was not a good citizen up to and including the power of life and death. However, women in Roman culture had more freedom than those in the Greek culture, mostly down to the necessity uh, because many Roman husbands were off fighting various wars as part of the Roman legion. So it was the women who were running things at home when the men were fighting in the army. A bit like how in the 1940s, many women went to work in factories in Britain and in America and Canada during World War II uh, as their husbands were in the army. So a similar kind of situation. Uh, women in the Roman Empire were counted as citizens in their own right. They could appeal to the state if need be for legal justice. Uh, rich women could be running their vast estates on behalf of their husbands. They could be running businesses. They could be investing. They were, being, they were involved in public works throughout the city. As citizens, they had the right to own property in their own name. Uh, we have ancient Roman documents about two women, for example, who owned and ran a brick factory. Uh, women could be scribes and secretaries to the Roman state and senate. 
As far as religion went, women were present at all religious festivals and often were involved as priestesses in the various gods and goddesses, often as full-time professional clergy. Women in the Roman Empire could attend public debates in the Forum, and they could also go to the Colosseum for the chariot races and the gladiator fights. In short, Roman women were under the authority of the pater familias, but they had far fewer legal, social, or religious restrictions, restrictions than those under Greek culture. And we will see this echoed in the new church in Rome. Just listen to some of the names. Uh, we're going to read the last chapter, or some of the last chapter of the epistle that Paul wrote to the Roman church. Uh, while he was in Corinth, he wrote this letter to the church in Rome. And we're going to hear the names of people involved in running the church. Um, now, we don't know exactly what the various offices and roles in the Bible exactly entailed. We don't know exactly the difference between deacons and elders and pastors and overseers and apostles and bishops. There's some overlap there and some disagreement on what exactly those roles were. But let's read Romans 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church of Centuria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Now, Phoebe uh, was a deacon. That's a formal church office. Uh, most likely what we would call today perhaps an assistant pastor or maybe a ministry leader. She was from the church in uh, Serentria, and she was the one that Paul gave the task to, to bring the epistle, the letter, to the Romans, to the church in Rome, and read it out loud to the church. Verse 3. So we have, first of all, Phoebe. Verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So Priscilla and Aquila, missionaries, uh, theological instructors and church leaders are now in Rome, and true to form, they are hosting the church at their house. Uh, given the Roman culture, it means that basically they were leading the church in some regards. Now note that Paul calls them here co-workers in Christ Jesus. He only uses that phrase for those that are leaders in the church who were official workers in his missionary teams and church plants. So uh, they were somehow officially working for the church. Verse 5 continued. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding amongst the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. So Andronicus and Junia, outstanding among the apostles, not the twelve apostles, the apostles here is another term used by Paul, given to various people that were church planters or missionaries. So uh, Junia and Andronicus, outstanding amongst these church planter and missionaries. The very interesting thing here is that Junia is a woman's name. There is no male version of Junia in ancient history. And she was an apostle, outstanding amongst the apostles. Just let that sink in for a moment. Verse 12, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. This phrase that Paul uses, worked hard in the Lord, it's Paul's term for having done ministry in the church, having built up the church. So in Romans 16, we have Phoebe, who is a deacon, tasked with carrying out, with carrying the epistle to the church in Rome and reading it out. Uh, we have Priscilla along with her husband Aquila who are co-workers with Paul who host the church in their home and we already know they teach theology. We have Mary, Tryphena and Tryphosa who work hard for the Lord and we have Junia, an apostle for the Lord's work and an outstanding apostle at that. So what we read in Romans 16 is that women played all kinds of leadership roles in the church in Rome. So to sum up uh, these things that we've talked about so far, in the book of Acts, women were gifted by the Holy Spirit to prophesy, and they played leading roles in the very beginning of the church movement. Priscilla, along with her husband, Aquila, is a missionary 
He, uh, she hosts and leads churches in her home, and she teaches theology to Apollos. In Corinth, which is a very restrictive Greek culture, uh, women are encouraged to pray and prophesy publicly in the worship meetings, even though the culture would have frowned on that. And in Rome, the less restrictive Roman culture, women were deacons, co-workers, church planters, church leaders, and even apostles. So at this point, we're going to just take a little break, a little pause. You can pause to just kind of take in all that information. Uh, on Sunday, we had a little break in between and people went and grabbed a coffee. Uh, and then uh, we're going to come back or in part two, we're going to reconcile all that we've learned so far from Old Testament, from the Gospels, from the New Testament, uh, because there is an equally God-breathed, inspired by God verse that the Apostle Paul wrote that seems to say the exact opposite of everything that we have read so far. And that is 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So 1 Timothy 2.12. So take a pause, have a cup of tea, cup of coffee, grab a cookie, walk around the block, whatever you got to do, and then hit play again. And uh, we'll continue with the next part. All right, see you then. Hey, Revelstoke Alliance Church, welcome to the final concluding part of our sermon series called We Are All One in Christ. And we're going to start off with the verse in 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So how does this verse, this uh, inspired, God-breathed uh, part of Scripture, tie in with everything that we've been learning in the past three weeks? Well, let's uh, break it down. When we interact with Scripture, to truly understand what it means, we have to do what the scholars call exegesis, which is a fancy word for meaning that we are to get at the root of what the text means in its original setting rather than reading into what we think it means from our perspective. So we've got some work to do to figure out what it meant in its original setting and then we draw out of that what it means for us today. We have to let the scripture speak to us. We don't tell the scripture what we merely think that it might mean. So how do we go about doing that? How do we work out what any passage of the Bible actually means. Well, I'll take you all through the process that I use before I preach any sermon. So we start off by looking at the context of the passage. And in this, I like to ask, who is the author? Who is the recipient? And what is the genre of writing? Now, we all know, we know that the author of this passage in 1 Timothy 2 verse 12 is Paul, the missionary to the Gentiles. He wrote much of the New Testament. He was a Jew, a well-trained Pharisee who persecuted Christians before being converted by Jesus personally on the road to Damascus. After that, God commissioned him to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and preach the gospel of Jesus. He planted churches in modern-day Turkey, Greece, and other Mediterranean countries. And he's writing to Timothy. Now, Paul is Timothy's mentor. Paul is charged Timothy with overseeing one of the church plants, the church in Ephesus. Timothy may well be the pastor there, probably is, or at the very least he is training the elders in that church in some capacity. Timothy, we know, is relatively young, definitely under 30. Um, he's relatively inexperienced in leading churches, and he looks to Paul for some guidance. And this is a personal letter from Paul to Timothy to encourage and instruct him how to be a good pastor, and how to be a good leader, and how to deal with some specific issues that were arising in the Ephesian church at that time. Okay, so the next thing we look at is the historical context. And we start off by looking at primary sources. That is, we look at writings of people who were alive in that era, who were around in that time, so that their eyewitness accounts of what was happening gives us some like first-hand inside information. So I'm going to read here from a passage of writing from a, a guy called Antipater of Sidon. He was a Greek poet writing in the second century BC, so about 200 years, 100 years or so before the passage in First Timothy. 
Um, and he was the one who made the list of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and he said, as we'll read, that the greatest of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. And let me read from him. I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossus of the sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramids, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the house of Artemis that mounted to the clouds, those other marvels lost their brilliancy. And I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on anything so grand. So in his opinion, in Antipater's opinion, uh, the temple of Artemis at Ephesus uh, was greater than the hanging gardens of Babylon or the walls of Babylon or even the great pyramid of Giza. You see, in Greek mythology, the birthplace of Artemis and Apollo was in a grove called Ortigia. And according to Strabo, the Greek philosopher and historian who lived in the first century, kind of right in that period, uh, first century before Christ and into the first century after Christ, uh, the Ephesians identified an area near the city with the same name and claimed that that was the site of the goddess Artemis's birth. Strabo goes on to say that Artemis was the mother uh, of the all-women warrior tribe called the Amazons, and that's the same myth that Wonder Woman is based on. So this was all centered around Ephesus. And we see this devotion to Artemis in the book of Acts when Paul first preached in Ephesus. And this is Acts 19, uh, verse 23 and onwards. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made three silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and he said, you know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul is convinced and led astray numbers of people here in Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Now, additionally, archaeology of the site of the Temple of Artemis has found hundreds of statues and idols of Artemis, or as the Romans would call her, Diana. Uh, and there's, uh, I posted a picture up on the overhead projector thing on Sunday. Uh, she is a goddess, and it seems that she's got many uh, globes and orbs hanging off her. We don't know if they are either breasts or eggs. Either way, they indicate a goddess of fertility rites and rituals. So that's the primary source. We've got the scripture in Acts, we have uh, Strabo, and we have Antipater. Now we look at secondary sources for, for context. We consult modern historians specializing in ancient Greek culture, and we find out that the cult of Artemis was led by a professional all-female clergy who worshipped Artemis as the goddess of fertility and safe childbirth, amongst other functions. The temple dimensions were 377 feet long, 151 feet wide, 40 feet high, made entirely out of white marble, held up by 127 solid marble columns gilded with gold and silver. And the entire temple was filled with renowned Greek sculptures and other works of art. Its sacrificial altar alone was so big it could hold over 100 animals at once. And the best estimates for the size of Ephesus at the time of the New Testament was somewhere between two and 300,000 people, uh, which is roughly the size of Burnaby or Saskatoon or a couple of times the size of Kelowna. Um, this is based off the size of the amphitheater there, which could hold 24,000 people at once. So it was a major city. And 
So we had an all-female clergy ministering in the most magnificent building in the world, serving the goddess Artemis, who was responsible for fertility and safe childbirth. And the city itself absolutely gained its primary identity from this religion in the temple. And into that setting steps Paul and then later Timothy to build up the church, the followers of Jesus. All right, so the next step, now that we've looked at the context, uh, we look at the entire book of 1 Timothy and we get the context of the, the theme of the entire book. When you're trying to discern the meaning of a particular passage, you need to start with the meaning of the whole book. Uh, and in the case of 1 Timothy, the meaning of the whole book is about false teachers influencing the new church. 1 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these things and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. So to combat the effects of these false teachers, Paul instructs Timothy about appropriate forms of worship and church service and who in that church would qualify as an elder or a teacher. According to the qualifications of an elder, 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 it says, an elder must be able to teach. So the issue at hand in 1 Timothy is false and incorrect teaching. Um, and we will investigate that a bit further. Now, do we know any of the specific points of this false teaching in Ephesus? Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 that the false teaching is demonic in nature, that false teachers are hypocritical liars, they forbid people to marry and to abstain from certain foods, false teaching results in unhealthy arguments and friction and malicious talk, and evil suspicions. False teachers often do it for money. Um, specific sources of false teaching in that church at the time, 1 Timothy 5 verse 11 talks about the source of that false teaching. Verse 11, as for younger widows, do not put them on such a list, for when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, have already turned away to follow Satan. Then 2 Timothy 3, it's uh, the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy um, about similar subject matter. Uh, verse 6, 2 Timothy 3, verse 6. They are the kind, that's false teachers, who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Jonas and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. So, in those scriptures, it says that the false teachers, maybe for money, for a financial gain, are targeting some women in the Ephesian church with their false doctrine. And the women in Greek culture, as we learned in the last uh, sermon, were uneducated and they weren't able to uh, to read or to um, to ha they haven't learned anything about the Bible. They probably were Gentiles, and so we've got this class of women who are used to being involved in religious work, but who are uneducated and who are being targeted by these false teachers to spread this false teaching within the small church, the early church in Ephesus. Next, as we try and extract the meaning. So now we know more of the context, but let's extract the meaning in the specific 
passage in question. We've got the background of Ephesus, the Temple of Artemis. It's all female clergy. And as I said, the context of the letters, the false teachers targeting the young women. And Timothy needs to oppose these false teachers and correct it by orderly worship and sound teaching. So given all that, let's look at this specific passage, 1 Timothy 2. And we'll look at a few verses before and after. Therefore I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and in full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But the woman will be saved through childbirth if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, for those who think this passage should apply to all churches at all times, uh, they highlight verses 13 and 14 and say that the order of creation in Genesis plays a vital part in recognizing an ongoing subordinate role that should apply to all women. Now, for those who disagree, they see Paul using an example of Eve being deceived to highlight the current deception that is coming into the church at that time, not a forever ban on all women everywhere. And as I said, given the entire lack of education for women in Greek culture and the few opportunities for women to be independent people, uh, the exception being the religion in Ephesus due to the temple. And opposition to the church from pagans and false teachers targeting these young women. It's no wonder that Paul writes, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, a quick aside about this word, assume authority. In Greek, that word is often teen. This is the only time it appears in the Bible. Its meaning is really hard to discern. In fact, uh, this usage here in 1 Timothy 2 is the oldest or one of the very oldest, one of the very first times this word is used in written down in uh, ancient Greek culture. Uh, it's not used that many times. It's not a common word. Uh, the few times that it has been used in other writing, it has connotations of abuse, misuse of authority, and even murder. So perhaps a better translation instead that women should not assume authority would be that women should not abuse authority. I don't think this is a blanket ban on any woman having any authority over any man in any circumstance. It's a ban on women abusing their religious authority in the Ephesian context. But there is no getting around that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit in a personal letter to Timothy, the young pastor of Ephesus, wrote, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So to help us further in discerning the meaning, we look at what's called the canonical context. How does it fit in with other scriptures? How does that scripture, how can that scripture be true and the other scriptures true at the same time? And that's basically the work, the work we've done in the previous three sermons. Um, what does the rest of the Bible say about women in leadership roles? How does this fit in with the rest of Paul's epistles, with the rest of the New Testament, with the rest of the whole scripture? Well, we saw that Paul encouraged women to pray and prophesy out loud in 1 Corinthians. We saw that Paul encouraged women in all kinds of leadership roles in the church in Rome. Women were present at the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit gave them gifts of prophecy too. Uh, Jesus reached across all kinds of gender boundaries, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus had female disciples, Mary sitting at his feet. Jesus commissioned Mary Magdalene to be the first preacher of his resurrection. Deborah in the Old Testament was a judge, a warrior, a prophet, and a poet of Israel, leading the entire nation. Eve was created to be an Ezer, Ezer Kenigdo, a supplier of strength equal in every way with Adam. And both Adam and Eve were created in God's image. So given that, given all the author, recipient, and genre of the book, the historical context, the context of the entire book of First Timothy about false teachers, the specific passage and the use of the word authentine, and the context of the rest of the Bible and what it says about women elders, 
Uh, given all of that, the scriptures in First Timothy forbidding women to lead the church or teach in the church, I believe, can only be limited to that church at that time during that situation. So if that is the case, if that is the right way to read it, if that is the right meaning from that text, um, if it's very much tied into the local situation, what is the lesson then that we can take away as a church? I think the lesson here is not that women should never teach in the church, but the church should adapt its form to the culture so that there is A, sound teaching of the gospel, and B, taught in a way that the local culture can hear it. Paul at his heart was a missionary. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. It's basically his missionary manifesto, how he went about doing his ministry. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. In other words, Paul did whatever it took for the gospel to be heard. The message was unchangeable, but the means were always flexible. He quoted Greek philosophers when he was preaching in Athens, but he quoted Old Testament prophets when he was preaching to the Jews in the synagogue. And after arguing successfully with the rest of the church that Gentiles do not need to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus, he turns around and had Timothy circumcised so that Timothy would be accepted in the Jewish synagogues to preach the gospel. And so the gospel and the means of that were modified to the different situation in different towns so the gospel could be heard. So we have then in Ephesus, no women teachers. In Corinth, women praying and prophesying. And in Rome, women leading the church. The methods changed, the church structure changed in order to reach that gospel with the culture. Now that's, uh, for example, how uh, our missionaries here in our congregation, and we all know who they are and which country they do missions work in, they need to present the gospel differently in that country and their presentation of that needs to be different than how we do it here in Canada. If you were to send missionaries to the Taliban, to Afghanistan today, I would argue that for the gospel to be heard, if you sent a married couple, a Priscilla and Aquila, and if they went to the Taliban in Afghanistan today, uh, for the gospel to be heard, Aquila, the husband, he should be doing all the preaching. Uh, for the gospel to be heard, um, Priscilla probably would be in a hijab and be very quiet. But if those same couple went as missionary couple to the Bribri of Costa Rica, where the women own all the land, the women rule society, and they're the only ones allowed to prepare the sacred ritual cocoa drink, then perhaps the women missionaries there would be doing all the preaching. Maybe it would be Priscilla taking the lead and Aquila taking a back seat in that one. So what about us, Revelstoke 2021? How will the gospel best be heard by our community? I am convinced. I am convinced that it will best be heard by us having both men and women leading the church in the role of elder. To do that, for that to happen, either the board of elders, current board of elders, have to put that proposal to all the members of the church at the AGM or especially called meeting, or... 20% of the members of the church give a written submission to the elders requesting such a vote. For such a vote to pass, it would need a two-thirds majority of the members who attend that special meeting. So elders and members, the ball's in your court. I only have one vote in that, in that, um, in that process. And so it needs for the whole church to move on this. Now, if you think back to... Uh, I think part two of the sermon series. And we read aloud the daily prayer of Orthodox Jewish men from back in the day, from back in the time of Jesus until now, 
that they pray, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, for not making me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That was the prayer. But then a former Jew, a trained Pharisee who knew the Torah, the Old Testament law inside and out. He, he was converted to Christ. And while he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is what he wrote himself. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord.